Um, so Rego asked me to do a talk about standardization uh, because I have done worked on standards for like a decade and a half. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about what is a standard. Um, so a standard, according to one definition, is an agreed, repeatable way of doing something. It is a published document that contains a technical specification or other precise criteria designed to be used consistently as a rule, guideline, or definition. So in other words, a standard is an agreement on technically precise criteria to consistently repeat something. So what do you want to repeat? Uh, well, hot water knobs, they generally all turn the same way so that you know whether you're going to get hot water or cold water. Uh, paper sizes are standardized. Uh, there's several different standards for it, but for the most part, there's a large agreement. It's not like every vendor has their own paper sizes. Uh, measuring soil properties. If you're doing, going to build a building, there's you have to test the soil to see how much load it can hold. There's standard procedures for how to do that. Um, displaying a web page, that's what we work on here. <laughs> um, there's closed standards and there's open standards. Uh, on the web, we deal with open standards. Uh, there's closed standards are things like, I guess, ISO maybe is closed because you can't participate in it unless you're a governmental organization or something like that, and then you have to pay for lots of money to get your hands on it. Um, we do open standards here. That's the, our standards are publicly available. They are freely implementable. Um, that means they're not patent encumbered. Uh, so you can implement CSS and not worry about Microsoft suing you because they added this feature to the spec. Uh, and we have a transparent process, so you can try to understand what's happening and why it's happening. Um, and it allows for public participation. So there's a number of benefits to it. Um, standardization process is a really great way to do collaboration among a lot of different organizations. Um, you get wider review of what you're doing, so that improves the quality of what you're trying to create. Um, it allows for developing consensus around what this community is going to do, and it forces you to create documentation of that consensus, which means we have much better interoperability because we all agreed on what we're going to do, and we documented it so that we can actually do the thing we agreed upon. Um, it also benefits the ecosystem as a whole. Um, having that open documentation and having this environment where everyone's kind of like on an equal playing field in the sense that we can all are allowed to implement the same things and nobody is like the person who decides what's going to happen in the context of this technology and then if they change their mind everybody else has to pivot and follow whatever they decided. We decide together. So that Neutrality um, allows for more competition, more diversity of implementations, and uh, greater, and that gives us better quality because competition and diversity give you better quality, and it also gives us better longevity. Um, as an open standards-based eco software ecosystem has a benefit that if one of the companies goes under, well, you know, there's other companies that are also participating and the entire ecosystem can continue to exist and flourish. So um, I'm not sure if the web will quite live to be 100 years old, but um, it tends to be a little bit more long-lived when you have this kind of open ecosystem and collaboration. So to do standardization, we have to actually, well, how do you do it? Well, you bring together the experience and expertise of all interested parties, such as the producers, sellers, buyers, users, and regulators of a particular material product process or service. Uh, what does that look like? So there's a lot of roles in standards. The way we do that at um, in a lot of web-related areas is there's a working group, oftentimes, or in the case of like W3C, we have like a, a working group, which is a kind of a committee. Um, of the people who make the decisions about that standard, but there's also the wider like community of people who participate in it because, again, it's an open standards process and public participation is allowed. So there's plenty of people who are not on the committee but who are giving input or s expressing opinions or s sending issues or s submitting suggestions. Um, within the working group, there's a couple of specialized roles. One is the chair. The chair's job is to facilitate the discussion. 
Um, and then there's the editor, whose job is to write down the things that we all agreed on. Um, and then you also have a number of roles that people play that you need to make sure you have accommodated them into your process. There's people who will review them. Some of them are going to be working group members. Some of them will be members of the public. Some of them will be implementers or testers or end users. You want to get people from all of these categories involved in looking at your standard and making sure it's doing what you think it is trying, solving the problem you're trying to solve and doing it a good job of it. Um, so how participating standards development is actually really easy. The first step is to read the spec. And then the second one is to complain about it. Um, if you want to go up one level, you can have opinions in the issues where they're discussing the complaints about it. And if you want to go really higher level, a little step up, you can suggest improvements. So you can be like, I have this opinion. Or you can be like, you could try fixing it this way. And probably like the most advanced level of participating in standards development is actually editing the spec. But you don't have to do that to participate in standards development. You can do just the first two. <laughs> so the level of involvement is up to you. We strongly recommend that you do read the spec and complain about it. Um, that helps the spec be a better spec. Uh, so if we expand the jobs of a spec editor, uh, the most obvious one is you edit the spec. Uh, but that is not the only job of a spec editor in, like, that's kind of officially their job, but what actually they end up doing is they also triage the issues, they design proposals to solve the issues, they evaluate proposals that either they or other people have submitted, and they solicit reviews from people. They go, like, hey, I need your review on this thing. I asked you last week. I asked you last month. Can you please review it? Um, and driving consensus. So as the discussion is happening, your job is to kind of make sure you're listening to all the different sides and trying to bring it all together by having a good proposal, which maybe incorporates aspects of everybody's concerns. Um, and wait, what am I doing? And now I don't know how I broke the slides. So yeah, so there's um, kind of standards. You have a lot of, one of your main goals is to get a lot of review. Um, and there's the most obvious kind of review is like kind of like a deep review by an expert. A lot of times we'll have somebody review, you might have somebody review, you pull your crest to your standard who is like, deeply involved in that particular technology, like an implementer, or if you're an implementer submitting a fix, maybe the editor. Uh, but also there's a concept of wide review, which is a broader community. As we mentioned, we want the users to look at what you're trying to build. We want the other implementers to look at what you're trying to build. We want, there's a bunch of nerdy people who think it's fun to think about this technology. You probably want them to look at it too, because People like them will find lots of problems. Oriole is an example of such a person who finds lots of problems like that. Um, and you want this kind of deep and wide review, both like within your group, but also within the broader community. So like in CSS, for example, we'll have like on grid issues, there's Rego and Javier or and Mats, who's the Mozilla's implementer, and you know, me and Tab Atkins will like dive deeply on an issue, but we'll also bring that issue up to the rest of the working group, kind of at a more abstract level, expect what, explain what we're trying to do to make sure we didn't miss anything, to make sure that we are actually doing something that makes sense from a user's perspective, to make sure that we are making decisions that are consistent with the rest of the CSS um, technology, which is a very broad and tangled up um, technology. Um, but there's also a kind of a specialist review. We call this horizontal review at W3C. These are people who don't have a deep experience in one particular technical area, but in one kind of cross-cutting topic, such as internationalization or accessibility or uh, the technical architecture of the web, which is what the tag does, um, or privacy and security. Um, so you often will want somebody from such those areas to actually take a look at your spec, make sure you address those issues. I happen to work on a lot of text-related specs. We rely very heavily on the internationalization community. <laughs> um, so your job as an editor is to formally address all of the comments, um, and that you may not ever get there, but you're going to try really hard. 
um, the first job of under formally addressing a comment is to understand what that feedback is. Uh, you might have to ask questions. What did you really mean here? What use case are you trying to solve with this weird proposal that you've posted? Um, and you try to analyze the problem and understand it, the problem, and you design and evaluate possible solutions, or you look at their solution, or you ask for help from your working group if you're not really sure what to do, um, and then discuss it and resolve it. That's deciding what you're going to do. No, it's a, just a demonstration of the need for me to stop spilling tea all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll thanks. Okay. Is this picking up? Maybe. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so once you've got some solutions, you discuss and resolve the issue by deciding, like pick one. Um, and then there's the job of editing the spec, which is the more obvious part of it. And then you also want to follow up and respond to the person who commented and be like, this is what we decided and this is why we decided it. Uh, sometimes the why is really obvious. You just, so if you fix a typo, you don't really have to explain much. Um, if you rejected their request, you kind of have to explain why. Uh, basically, your job as an editor is to try to make everyone happy. Um, and so sometimes you can't accept their request, and then they're going to be sad, but you can explain, like, this is why. And maybe they'll be like, oh, OK. I guess that makes sense. I'm like sad that I didn't get the thing I wanted, but I understand where you're coming from and why I didn't get accepted. Um, and so I would say like the majority of the things that come into the CSS working group, when we address the issue, we satisfy the commenter. In some cases, we didn't actually make a change to the spec. We made a clarification because there was some confusion. In other cases, we actually made a change or added a feature. And in a few cases, we're like, no, we're not going to do that, and here's why. And most of the time, people are like, oh, OK, that seems all right. Um, and once in a while, they're like, no, I hate you guys. <laughs> but that honestly doesn't happen very often, because we try to respond with good rationale. <laughs> and the last thing you want to do as part of your response is to solicit the commenter's verification of your thing. So if you responded and said, we are rejecting your issue, and here's why, can you let us know if you're OK with that? And they're like, I'm OK with that. Then you're like, yeah, I'm really good. I have, the person is happy. I can mark their issue green. Um, and if they respond that they're unhappy, like maybe they're like, well, I understand you tried to fix my issue, but actually you didn't do a good job of it. Then they'll tell you why you didn't do a good job of it, and you can try again. Um, so part of that was resolving on the issue, so that involves making decisions. There's different ways that standards groups make decisions. Um, some of them delegate to an editor. Some of them rely on the consensus of the working group. Some of them, I guess, probably vote. Um, and in most cases, it's some combination of the two. So for example, this is, the, this is how the CSS working group operates. Um, unlike the what working group, the editor is not in charge. The authority for making decisions is the CSS working group as a whole. But we don't have time to deal with every little thing all the time. So um, we delegate to the editors. And what we delegate to the editor changes as the draft gets more and more mature. So that here, when it's changing a lot, like the editors can just handle the feedback and make a lot of changes. But here, once we've got like a lot of implementations and things are really stable, then we need the working group to kind of be involved in the decision making to make sure that we got 
the input from the various implementers and to make sure that they're aware of the changes and will actually go and implement them. Um, to make decisions, you need to communicate. So there's a variety of ways of communicating. There's async methods such as email and discussions in the bug tracker. Uh, chat is usually, in most cases, it's a kind of an informal channel for discussion. And then telecons and face-to-face -face meetings. Some groups operate entirely in this zone. Um, some groups entire, operate in, almost entirely in this zone. Like this discussion is all unofficial and we only make decisions and actually have real discussions here. Like this is just to track the topic. And a lot of groups do kind of a mix of all of these things. Uh, in the CSS working group, we make decisions on telecons and face-to-face -face meetings but we do a lot of the prep work for that discussion in the bug tracker to prepare this, what we're talking about, what we're planning to maybe have initially some initial idea of what we want to do and just getting verification from the CSS working group, the rest of the members. Or in some cases, like you don't really know what to do and you're like, help me figure out this problem. Um, part of the reason why CSS working group does telecons and face-to-face -face decisions is to make sure we actually get input from members of the community that are not in, involved specifically in that issue. Uh, everybody's really busy and they like don't want to pay attention to their email. And if it's not directly relevant to what they're working on, they're like, I don't want to pay attention to this. Um, but we often need their review because they have important things to say. Um, if David Barron hasn't looked at your spec, it's probably wrong. So we try to make sure that we bring the issues up so that other people can be aware of what's going on, even though they are kind of busy and not really reading all their email. Uh, another reason why we do synchronous decisions here, which I don't think it's a reason why we do it, but it's a benefit of it, is that as we're discussing our way through the decision-making process and explaining, like, these are the proposals we thought about, this is why we're thinking about doing this one, these are various points that other people bring up, it helps to share the knowledge of what's going on in CSS across more of the members of the working group. And so, like, I've learned a lot more about fonts than I would ever know because issues around fonts have been discussed on the teleconference. And that means I can account for some of those issues when I'm working on my spec. And when we're working on one particular layout spec, the other people who are following along can see how we're making decisions and what kind of ideas and principles and patterns we're following and use that when they're making decisions in their own module. Because we want CSS to kind of feel like a consistent, coherent system. And if we divided ourselves into like mini subcommittees of three or four people who only focus on the issue that they are programming, then that consistency and that integration would probably fall apart. Um, so yeah, different groups do things differently. It's good to find a good balance. Uh, there's also worth mentioning that different people operate better or worse in different modes of communication. Some people don't really like speaking up face to face, it's really intimidating, and they'd much rather make their comments here, or they just hate meetings and they won't show up to them. We had like, Dave Hyatt was in the CSS working group for a while, he only showed up to I think one meeting, but he was active on the mailing list, so we knew what his opinion was. Even if you know we were having a discussion in person, we could read his email and be like, all right, this is what David Hyatt said. Let's take all of those points into consideration. Um, but on the other hand, there's other people who find it really hard to, uh, to operate on this in a written form. And it's easier for them to think and process things when they're talking about it with other people. And so if you only do written communication, you won't get very engaged participation from those people. They'll be struggling. They maybe won't even comment at all. So it's kind of like, I personally think it's good to have like a mix of different modes so that you can get input from all different people and different types of input. And different issues often are better suited to one type of discussion versus the other. Um, some really complicated like details, technical stuff on like the de depths of the like grid algorithm often we can think about it across multiple weeks and poke at various fine details here and then present a high-level discussion here and make sure that everyone understood it, but do it at face-to-face -face where we can draw stuff on the whiteboard and like go off in the corner and explain things to people. And then, you know, contentious discussions often work better face-to-face -face because you just have a higher bandwidth communication channel when you're in the same room as someone else. Um, so as a part of that, I wanted to do a brief summary of how to run a good meeting. 
The first thing is you need an agenda, which has a goal for each item. You need to have a chair who has the power to actually chair. Um, and the job of the chair is to evaluate consensus, manage time, make sure people are on topic and not going off into like little irrelevant corners of the topic. Uh, manage queuing, so if people want to talk, make sure everybody gets a chance. Who, who wants to talk gets a chance. And make people shut up when they need to. Um, you want to have a scribe. The job, scribe's job is to clearly record the conclusions and ideally also what led to them. If you didn't write down your conclusions, your meeting basically didn't happen. So have a scribe. And then the other thing, which I think a lot of people forget, is to support each other's participation. Uh, that means voicing your opinions and also helping other people speak up. Um, if you sit in the corner and you're silent constantly, the rest of the people don't know if you agree or disagree with what's going on. And we're operating by consensus here, right? We're trying to get everybody to agree. And if you have not expressed yourself in any way, shape, or form, it's hard to know whether you're even paying attention or if you are like unhappy with what's happening or whatever. So like having an opinion, if you have an opinion, you should speak up. And even if it's like a minor comment or something that expresses like, yeah, I'm in favor of this thing, it helps the chair understand that, yes, we actually have a, an active agreement on this and not just like nobody cares. Um, and helping other people speak up is if you notice somebody else is trying to talk or they haven't talked but you think they have probably a useful opinion on this topic, you can encourage them to talk or make sure that there's space for them to talk. Um, and so this is kind of like a group thing that you do. The chair is supposed to do that as well, but it's also the rest of the room needs to help. Um, so standardization, I think the work falls into three basic categories. The one that we think about a lot is uh, designing new features. But a lot of the work is actually bug fixing existing features. And in some cases, reverse engineering what things has already been implemented and then documenting the, that work. Um, a lot of the HTML5 spec parsing algorithm, like the parsing algorithm, for example, um, and a number of other aspects of it are reverse engineering projects, basically. Um, and it's not just that you're reverse engineering one implementation. You want to like figure out what all of them are doing and then figure out, do they agree? And then, this is what we're doing because they agree, or if like they all do different things, and you have to figure out which one's the most sensible one. Um, but I'd say probably most of the work falls into here. You design a new feature, you make a draft, and then the next five years you're fixing it. Um, so the goal, one of the major goals of standardization is interoperability. And what interoperability looks like is that the specification, the implementation, the test suite, and the web content all agree on what that thing is and how it's supposed to work. And this is kind of like an iterative process as like each thing fixes itself with respect to the other ones until we all have a common understanding of this feature. And that's it. Uh, I'm open for questions on anything related to standards, how to write specs, and format them with bike shed, whatever. <laughs> Where things go wrong. Um, I think one of the key things that you need to need before you can have a successful standardization effort is well, when you need you need a shared goal. If you don't agree on what you're trying to accomplish, you're probably not going to get there. So, like, I think in CSS we've been lucky that everyone who's participating has a similar vision for what CSS should be and what makes a good CSS feature. Um, in other standards groups, if you haven't you, you might have very contentious division of like this per, this con camp wants this feature to be this kind of a f technology and the other camp wants something different. You need to come to an agreement on like what does it mean for this technology to be successful? Well, not just like in terms of deployment, but like what does it mean for it to be well done? Right? And if you have that agreement, then everything else becomes a lot easier. Another way of failing is bad chairing. Um, if the chair is not able to like set an agenda that's meaningful, if they can't control the discussion in a way that it makes progress, um, then that's not going to work. Another method of failure is nobody wants to do the work. Uh, I've seen some groups where they're like, 
there's just nobody steps up to do actual work. And so you just have lots of discussions that just go nowhere because there's nothing to discuss because nobody did anything. Um, I think those are the three major ways I've seen failures. Uh, so I think like I can go over like CSS working group um, principles, but um, let me ask if anyone else has questions. All right, give me one sec. So when we're working on stuff, we want to all agree on what makes a good feature, right? So underlying what we do on the web standards are kind of some very basic principles. One of them is cross that its web has to be cross-device and cross-platform. So it needs to work on all these different modes, all these different operating systems, different rendering architectures, different input devices. Like it should be designed in a way that if you add another one to this list, it just works. It might need some like thought on the part of the person who is adding another thing to the list. It might require a lot of effort on there, but it should be fairly evident how it, it can work. And then all of the existing content needs to be able to work with that new thing. And we have so far been pretty successful in that regard. We add new input devices, we add new operating systems, and the web is able to work, and those web pages that existed already are able to operate. And we do that by not being terribly specific to each of these things. Like, if you, like, the, the, the link tag is not designed so that it only works when you click on things. It's like, there's a concept of activation. You can activate things in multiple ways. There's these levels of abstraction which allow us to handle all of these different input devices. Oh, like CSS struggles a lot with, like one of the big ones for CSS is this one. Like if you have all these different sizes of stuff, how do we make things work well for that, right? Um, and then for the input devices is a big issue for people working with events. Um, another one is that the web is worldwide, so all writing systems and languages need to work. Um, and we do actually, like if you look at software in the 90s, like people deployed a different software package for each region of the world. It would have be code, code, like you would have the Japanese version of your software and it would, the entire compiled thing would be different. Um, you would only have bidirectional text support in the one that you're shipping to the Middle East. You would only have CJK support in the one you're shipping to Japan and China. And we now have a platform that can handle almost any writing system, which is amazing. Um, another big one is forwards and backwards compatibility. Uh, and so part of that is having um, forwards compatible features. So like forwards compatible parsing is like you ignore the stuff you didn't understand so that when new stuff is introduced, you don't just fall flat on your face. And the other is like having, in CSS we'll call it levels and not versions. In the case of HTML, it's just like a continuously growing living standard. But it's basically this idea that as the, as the technology develops, you don't replace it with something new that has different behavior. It expands, it becomes more refined, but it doesn't change really that much. And that means content, content that used to work before continues to work. You can load web pages from the late 90s and they work mostly okay on your current browser. And so one of the things you're doing here is trying to design for progressive enhancement and graceful degradation. You want to make that possible, and these are techniques we'd use to do that. And that's what lets web pages and browsers evolve in a gradual and continuous manner and allows designers in, to transition to new features and to have old stuff still work and old browsers still able to process their page while the new browsers are also processing their page. Um, separation of content and style is a pretty important one for HTML and CSS. I don't know what's wrong with my size. Um, and we do that for a number of reasons, including accessibility and stuff. Uh, efficiency, just being able to do multiple things, changing stuff over time. Uh, and so those are some of the core things. And the reason we do all this stuff 
um, is that we want the data to be accessible. So the goal of the web is basically to make information accessible. And so that's an important way of doing that is making sure everybody can access it, including people with old browsers, including people in China. Um, and so in CSS, we have more specific design principles we have to deal with. Um, but like each group has to like have an understanding of what their principles are and what makes a good feature. Like for us, it has to be, you want to be powerful enough to do the things you want to do. You want to be flexible enough to adapt to be a, like if it's a layout system, it has to adapt to different window sizes. So it can't just be like fixed sizes. Like fixed sizes works if you're dealing with print because you only ever have one size that you're printing your poster at. But that's not how the web works. So CSS has flexbox and grid and multi-column designed in a way that they take up space so that each time that you lay out the page, it looks like it was always designed to be in that space. We want it to be robust, which means that it, if stuff isn't what exactly the author expected, it doesn't fall flat and just break. If there's a little bit more content than you thought, somebody ran Google Translate on it, somebody, uh, it's user-generated content, it, you know, it's a two-line heading instead of a one-line heading because it happened to be a little bit long and it wrapped. Somebody loaded in a narrower page. Uh, it needs to continue to be readable, even if it's not, you know, perfectly pretty. But it needs to work because the user wants to read that content. Um, we want to make our features understandable so that the users can actually use them, and we want them to be performant because, I mean, you can do really fancy rendering if you are willing to take a few minutes to do so. But people don't want to wait a few minutes to load a web page; they want it to see it almost instantly. So we, there's some layout algorithms we can't add to the browser because they would just be too slow. So these are considerations that we have when we are evaluating features and designs for features. And so for your working group, you have to figure out what are the things that you care about. What's, what's gonna, if you're designing a feature, what characteristics does it need to have before you're like, yeah, that's a feature that belongs here, is well designed, it fits, really fits in well with the rest of our platform, our technology. Any other questions? Yes. Um, two questions. Has uh, the recent Microsoft adoption to Chromium caused any negative or positive influence on how you guys do editing? So maybe the question is, uh, a lower level, on the vendor level change, how does that influence the higher level, or the level if it does at all? So I think that we're not going to really understand the full impact of that for a while. Um, part of it's going to depend on how engaged Microsoft remains. So for example, Opera adopted the Blink rendering engine and then just disappeared. Right. So they have zero influence on web standards now. Um, but Microsoft has stayed engaged because there's a number of things that they care about um, that Google doesn't care about as much. And they're working on those things. So like really high on their, like accessibility is really high on their list. And so they've put more effort into trying to get that, working on features for that, in both in terms of implementing it and also in terms of like trying to make sure the spec includes the things that they want. Um, my concerns around the adoption of Chromium are more along the issue of competition and diversity. Uh, I think when you have a monoculture, it's not very resilient. Um, and there's also the fact that there's so much engineering resources on this one implementation. Uh, I know that WebKit and Gecko are struggling to keep up with the vast amount of stuff that Google and Microsoft, but mostly Google, is proposing. So that's been a, a source of issues, not as much in the CSS working group, but I know that's been an issue in like the platform in general. Um, so it's, it's kind of like creating this very skewed field. And then in terms of the actual web content, uh, when you have a dominant browser that's got like a high enough market share, as we did like around IE6 era, and as we are starting, starting to have now as well, um, and we've had in like niche categories in the past as well, like for like mobile phones for a while, like WebKit was super dominant. Um, is that people start to write content for that and they don't consider other browsers. And then those browsers end up with fewer users because the content doesn't work as well on their browser. Um, and then that kind of like increases, it's like a positive feedback loop, so it increases the skew in the market share. 
And then that, it doesn't work very well for the dominant browser vendor either. Like I know that the Google engineers are a little frustrated because it makes it hard for them to fix bugs because people start to depend on that buggy behavior and they're like, but we wanted to fix this and now it's breaking websites if we do that. So the web as a whole, I think, is um, more resilient when there's more implementations. Um, so it's a little bit of a concern. But in terms of the standards efforts, Microsoft hasn't yet pulled back from their engagement in CSS. I don't know if that will continue to be true. One more question. Um, how do you approach a specific vendor that doesn't get involved at all on its back? Like, say, Chromium and Firefox, they come in, but Reggie doesn't. Do you reach out uh, on a personal level or corporate level at all? Or you just um, probably depends on exactly what it is, but generally, like if it's something that is holding back the web, generally, then we'll probably reach out to their engineers and be like, "Hey, like, can you implement this?" And maybe they do, and maybe they don't. We can't really control them, but to a certain extent, market pressure does have an effect on that. So if two of the browser vendors are implementing a feature and the third one doesn't, it creates more pressure for them to implement that because people are relying on it and web pages will not work as well. Now, how much pressure is applied there depends on how popular that feature is and how critical it is to that to web pages working. If it's a very slight adjustment to like the text layout, it might not be a high priority for them. But if it is like, you know, major new layout feature or major new like event model or something like they're going to start running into problems and also depends on the market share like if if like two small market share browsers implement something and the major one doesn't the web is not really going to create as much pressure as if the dominant one and another one did that so um there's a certain amount of like self correction built into the way that like web content is depending on and browsers are interdependent. Yeah? Can I ask, how did you yourself initially get involved? Because 15 years is an awfully long time. <laughs> I only like two years ago myself was like, Sam, is that something I can do? <laughs> <laughs> so what happened with me um, was that I was playing around with HTML and CSS and I found a bug in Netscape. This is a long time ago. So this is like 1999, I think. And I had read about the Mozilla project in a magazine while like waiting around in a waiting room. <laughs> so I ended up trying to report the bug to Netscape and then eventually landing on the Mozilla project. At that point, um, the Mozilla web page was a, this kind of like black and red and white. Like, it was purely open source project because Netscape was the one that was shipping. And they had, like, milestone bills you can download of their current work. They had recently switched to Gecko. It was really slow. It's like running a debug build of Gecko right now. Like, um, but I'm actually probably most slower. And I found that they fixed the bug. Later I found out the reason they fixed the bug is because they rewrote the rendering engine. Um, but I played around with this implementation because I was like, oh, it supports some of this new stuff that I like read about and I wanted to try it out and then I eventually found another bug because, hey, there's plenty of bugs to find. Um, and so I reported that bug and an engineer fixed it and I was like, this is cool. <laughs> so I reported more bugs and Mozilla at that point had really good documentation for getting involved. It wasn't a lot of documentation, but it was very like heartfelt and like direct. And it's like our engineers are trying to like keep up with this, like trying to deploy this new engine to like make the web better and like you know compete against Microsoft and like whatever. Please help us. Our engineers are drowning in bugs. You don't need to know how to program. Just help us triage the bugs. And um, this is how you triage a bug: is you look at the bug and the bug will say something like, "This web page is broken in Mozilla." And you're like, "Okay." Please tell it, like, figure out what is actually broken. So you make simplified test case. You figure out what features are interacting in a way that's broken. And then give an overview of the problem, the expected results, the actual results, have, why they're not matching should be obvious from the bug report. If it's not, clarify that. If there's a spec that says what's supposed to happen, then link to the spec. So 
I did triage on the bug reports, and well, when you link to the specs and they're like, this is what's supposed to happen, and the spec doesn't say what's supposed to happen, then there's a bug in the spec. So I started reporting the bugs to the specs. Um, and at that point, you would report bugs on mailing lists because we didn't have issue trackers. And after a few years of reporting bugs and in some cases making suggestions on how they should be fixed, apparently the CSS working group got kind of tired of this and decided to ask me if I wanted to help edit specs. My first spec was CSS text, which is still not done. <laughs> and and that's how I got involved. Um, yeah, they're, they're like, you want to help us edit specs? I was like, yeah, that's all like fun. So that became my hobby. Um, and then after a few years, I graduated college. And then I was like, you know, I spent all my time on this. Maybe I should try to get a job doing that instead of doing it in my spare time and basically having two jobs. So that's, I think, yeah, that's very much it. I did do a little bit of coding work on Gecko as well, uh, but there was just always so much spec work that I kind of became full-time specs. Any other questions? When CSS specs exist? Um, the last time I actually counted them, which was maybe a year or two ago, there was 108. And about half of them were edited by either me or Tab or both. <laughs> um, if we account for which ones are actively edited, that percentage is probably higher. Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. One of the major disadvantages is that, well, there's only two of us. Um, so we're constantly way behind. Uh, the advantage is that we have a really broad scope between like me, Tab and David Barron, I think each part of CSS is covered by like at least two people who know a lot um, and are like each really expert in at least a third of the, or two thirds of the, the technology in, in various different overlaps, um, which means that we can see the interconnections between the different modules and where they need to be consistent or where they need to um, align in how they're doing things, or if there's an issue here, it also it probably exists in these other places, and that's really useful is to have these like super generalist people who understand a large range of what's happening and not just a really deep slice of the technology. Any other questions? Okay, right. so basically uh, the summary is. Please participate in standards, read them, implement them, and complain about them. And if you really want to, you can also edit them. But at least do the first three. <laughs> okay, thank you.